we'll get started to give our guests a full amount of time. So it's a real pleasure today to welcome Dr. Anthony LaMancha from George Washington University. Many of you know Anthony. He's actually been here before, not that long ago. Uh, he currently serves as the Lieberman Professor of Neuroscience and Director of the George Washington University Institute for Neuroscience. And he's also a Professor of Anatomy and Cell Biology there. Uh, Anthony did his undergraduate work at the University of Chicago, PhD in neuroscience at Yale, postdoc at Washington University. And along the way there, he worked with some of the truly greats in developmental neuroscience, starting with Ray Guillory at the University of Chicago. And I, I would think that Anthony really picked up a lot of some, uh, the ideas and insights uh, working with Ray that he has really gone to school on over the years and made great use of. Uh, even as an undergraduate, he was studying some very interesting uh, aspects of afferentation, innervation of the thalamus during development, uh, and had some publications with Ray over the next few years from his undergraduate work. Uh, for his PhD at Yale, he worked with Pashka Rakish, uh, was studying uh, axon overproduction and elimination in the uh, pathways connecting the two hemispheres and the corpor corpus callosum. Uh, and also, through his connection with Ray Guillory, for, I realize for some of you, you may not know these names, but for the rest of you anyway, um, he made a connection with Chris Walsh, one of Ray's former MD-PhD students at the University of Chicago. The lab at the same what, were you in the lab with Chris? Okay. Chris went on to Harvard, where he's now a professor of uh, pediatric neurology, I believe, and has done some incredible work himself on cortical development and uh, dysmorphologies and heterotopias. A anyway, point being um, that uh, Anthony connected with Chris and, and has done some really fascinating work that uh, builds up some of that on cortical development. And then at Washington University, when Dale Purvis was there, he was working on an elaboration of circuitry of the olfactory bulb, which really became a mainstay of a lot of his contributions over the years, uh, looking at glomerular pattern development, doing imaging in living mice, some of the first really elegant work on the olfactory bulb. Uh, and then uh, moved uh, along, I, I guess, with Dale at the time down to uh, Duke. And at Duke University, I didn't realize this till I was talking uh, to Anthony, that he took over running their transgenic mouse core there for a number of years. And believe me, that's a thankless task and a wonderful thing that he did for all those folks. Uh, and then was, he was a research associate there, uh, joined the faculty in neurobiology, and then moved down the road to the University of North Carolina as the, in the Department of Cell and Molecular Physiology, where he was a professor and directed the Mental Health Research Center there at UNC. Uh, and then in uh, 2010, he became a professor of pharmacology and physiology at George Washington University, where he directs, as I said, the Institute for Neuroscience. And now he's the Lieberman Professor of Neuroscience there. Uh, he's won lots of awards. I won't go through all of them. I'm just going to mention a few. He won uh, recognition in the National Down Syndrome Society Science Scholar Award. Uh, he's won multiple awards from NARSAD, uh, including their Watercraft, uh, Watercraft Award and the Nicholson Award. He serves as reviewing editor on the editorial boards for a number of important journals in development, including uh, the Genetics, Molecular, and Developmental Section Editor for Cerebral Cortex, and on the uh, editorial board of Gene Expression and other journals. So in a nutshell, uh, Anthony's work has uh, really been characterized by, I think, some of the uh, most innovative and insightful looks at how uh, development occurs. Uh, as I said, the olfactory system has been a favorite part. He's given us real understanding of the uh, retinoic acid signaling pathway uh, and induction of olfactory pathway formation by studying this particular aspect of development. Uh, he went on to uh, focus in over recent and maybe not so recent years on the 22Q11 uh, syndrome, this microdeletion syndrome, and from that has gleaned insights not only into development of the brain, but related understanding of these uh, genetic effects on development of other tissues in the body as well that span all the way from the aortic arch and the heart to the limbs, for example, as well as uh, the brain. Uh, and through this, um, he has gotten into some really additional exciting things recently that I think we're going to hear about today, uh, looking at dysphagia during development, a lot of developmental disorders, disorders that have swallowing uh, and eating uh, disorders associated with them, and has really begun to understand and dissect this behavior, uh, complicated and life-giving important behavior uh, in a way that heretofore has not been described by understanding this genetic syndrome. Uh, and what are the effects on cranial nerves and the circuitry that give rise to these types of behaviors. So he, he really has become and is a giant in the field of developmental neurobiology, and it's really great to have him here today. I look forward to your talk. Welcome, Anthony. Thank you, Mike, and thank you for that really generous 
introduction. And you know, as you grow up and on in this business, um, you know, you, you don't have even an awareness of, well, what is it that I actually have done? And to have it inflated in such a way is actually very, is very flattering. And, you know, if my mother and father were alive, they'd be very proud. Um, so it is really nice to be here again. Um, and, you know, as Mike alluded to, this issue of, you know, sort of, we tend to disembody the brain when we think about how it works, and particularly in the context of neurodevelopmental disorders, many of the well-known um, signs of those disorders set in as the infant um, continues to develop, and they're more in the realm of complex disorders, and they're recognized as time goes on. But it became clear to me and to my colleagues quite some time ago that there were other aspects that were sort of tra fellow travelers with neurodevelopmental disorders. And this included craniofacial malformations. And you know, the bottom line on craniofacial malformations was that yes, while they may involve um, indirectly the early developing nervous system because of the role of neural crest in these things, that they were basically in the realm of building biomechanical apparatuses that just work. Um, but, you know, as we began to think about this more deeply and recognize that many of the mechanisms that put together circuits in the forebrain are actually shared by completely surprising places like the heart and the limbs, et cetera, and the face, um, we thought, well, maybe we need to revisit this idea that these things are really separate. So this was in my mind when I arrived at GW, actually, and I worked to put together a group that would actually look at this. And the thing that arose was that across all neurodevelopmental disorders, and I'll tell you more about this in a moment, all of these kids have a much higher incidence of difficulties with feeding and swallowing from birth onward. And I put together a whole group of people that include people at Children's Hospital and also the University of Missouri. And at the outset, because this was such a group effort, I want to acknowledge all of them. I won't read their names, but this when I say I, I mean they. When I say me, I mean we. And so these are the people who have really labored over the last seven years or so to really put this story together. Now, the way that I came at this story was recognizing that, you know, yes, there are these complex learned and acquired behaviors, but there was this whole list emerging of behaviors that were referred to as innate behaviors that had dedicated circuits that actually were put in place and could operate to operate the cognate behavior without much in the way of learning. And many of these behaviors were, you know, things that emerged again with, with postnatal development like aggressive behavior, sexual behavior, blah, blah, blah. But I thought, well, you know, there are other innate behaviors that are present at birth. And the, so if you look at the lifespan, you know, there's a number of behaviors that arise. And we sort of start when, you know, we begin to be locomotive. But actually, I thought about it a little bit more, and there's one that's really essential that has to be in place at birth onward, and that's feeding. Because if you don't do that, none of the other behaviors are possible because you're not going to grow, you're not going to thrive, et cetera. And remarkably, there was very little known about the underlying biology. If this was a behavior that had to be in place at birth, you have two jobs at birth, well, maybe a few more, but two, two main jobs at birth is you have to start breathing on your own and you have to start eating. And surprisingly, little was known about both, but particularly about the feeding and swallowing. And so, you know, there's a infant doing exactly that. And, you know, it's sort of obvious, but I'll remind you that optimal feeding and swallowing generates appropriate nutrition for any vertebrate, actually, but particularly for mammals from birth onward. Um, also, appropriate feeding and swallowing ensures that the airways are not going to be obstructed because food has to be ingested, but also you have to maintain a clear airway. Um, this minimizes the problems of aspiration, and of course, all infants aspirate a little bit, but this actually 
the circuit that is in place to operate the biomechanical apparatus that, that, um, that enables feeding and swallowing controls that apparatus in such a way to minimize that. And of course, this ensures continued growth and health. And that really is one of the markers, the obvious markers, of problems in infants around feeding and swallowing is they do not grow and their health status is in general very poor. And as I'll tell you again, but I'll tell you now, with children with a wide range of neurodevelopmental disorders, including genetic syndromic disorders, as well as as they go forward, they are subsequently diagnosed with the more broad diagnostic categories like autism, spectrum disorders, or ADHD. Feeding and swallowing problems are often a first sign of something that's up. So when there's suboptimal feeding and swallowing, this is referred to as dysphagia. Um, most of the work on these problems has actually been done in adults who have experienced strokes or have neurodegenerative disorders because they too have a problem with this behavior. But very little has been done um, understanding the underlying mechanisms and development. What happens? Well, of course, nutrition is compromised. Airway obstruction, and this is a major problem because this can lead to, you know, great um, danger for the infant early on. There is a high incidence of aspiration-based infection that happens because of the inability of the biomechanical apparatus controlled by the circuit. Um, to prevent that, and there's diminished growth in health. So clearly, this is an issue that arises. It arises at birth. And one of the questions that really came into my mind was this, if this is really an innate behavior that has to be in place and available to an infant at birth. There should be a distinct developmental program to ensure that it's there, to ensure the optimization of the behavior from birth onward. And that was really the question we set out to ask, was you know, some it, things were known about craniofacial development, but what about a dedicated circuit to actually operate this? Now, I have a prize for anyone who's watching carefully because my colleague Tom Maynard drew this, and he is not a neuroanatomist. And there is a big mistake here, but I decided to leave it in because, you know, I will reward anyone who actually picks up on the mistake here, but I'm not going to tell you, and don't call it out now. We'll come back to this at the end. This is for all of you who've taught medical school neuroanatomy. Um, so this really depends. The circuit, obviously, to me anyway, depended on having the cranial nerves intact. The sensory information really relies on, prime, uh, for the first order, sensory information coming in through the, the maxillary and mandibular branches of the trigeminal nerve. And so we're going to look at that. And the motor output relies on the output of the seventh, the ninth, and the twelfth nerves. And that's indicated here. And so I thought, well, is it possible that in some way there is a dedicated developmental program that actually guides the development of this integrated circuit? And also, is it possible that in, particularly in syndromic neurodevelopmental disorders, that the genetic lesion that causes the other difficulties in circuit construction and function is actually striking early to compromise this circuit as well? And so that's the question that we set out to answer. Now, fortunately, all of the circuitry in a developing mouse is available to us. We can visualize it beautifully. This is a an axon stain of the cranial nerves, and you'll see preparations like this um, in a variety of, of guises. And you can see all of the cranial nerves here. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at how initially, even before the cranial nerves begin to develop, how you establish the capacity of the developing neural tube to generate this particular circuitry. And then we're going to look at how it differentiates in order to provide a functional circuit at birth and in the perinatal period to optimize feeding and swallowing. So as I said, in, even in typically developing children, there is an incidence of feeding and swallowing problems from birth up to about 45%. About 15 to 20% of them have very severe issues. 
This is no other developmental pathology diagnosed. Um, some have more mild issues. In all developmental disorders, the fraction raises to about 85%. And in the 22Q and 1.2 deletion syndrome, which I will explain to you genetically in just a moment, this syndromic um, uh, disease, which arises from a microdeletion on chromosome 22, um, has 100% penetrance of some feeding and swallowing problems. Um, some of them are neonatal, about a little less than half arise at neonatal during the neonatal period. And then the rest continue throughout the first several years of life. They're actually added on. And this turns out to be one of the most vexing clinical problems for these kids, both because of the issues with um, aspiration, particularly in the face of cardiovascular surgery, because these kids also have cardiovascular malformations. And so this emerged as a really important problem. And so the question that I posed actually had a little bit more structure to it, because we could actually ask whether or not the genomic lesion that causes the other later arising issues with behavior, which are in the realm of the same sort of cognitive and social behavioral um, deficits that arise in autism, ADHD, and even schizophrenia, whether or not that same genomic lesion that disrupts the higher order circuitry that performs those behaviors is also disrupting the assembly of this circuit that has to be in place, intact, at birth to guide this essential behavior. So how do we look at that? Well, what the deletion, what the disorder is in humans is it's a microdeletion of minimally 32 chromosomes. It's a heterozygous deletion. Um, on the long arm of chromosome 22, it's fairly close to the centromere. And the heterozygous deletion and change in dosage of these 32, minimally 32 genes, is responsible for all of the developmental anomalies that are seen, which include um, structural brain anomalies, cleft palate, thymic hypoplasia, congenital heart anomalies, limb digit anomalies and these feeding and swallowing difficulties as a clinical sign. And so we've done a lot of work looking in the mouse genomic model. This is a genomically accurate model. The same 32 genes are actually 28. Four of them that are not expressed in the brain or on other chromosomes are contiguous. You can do the same heterozygous deletion by chromosome engineering, which we helped out with Raj Kucharopati's lab when they did that. And then we have taken these mice and really focused on looking at particularly the brain and related anomalies. They have the whole spectrum of phenotypic change that's seen in the humans. These mice model that. So not only is this model genomically accurate, it's also phenotypically accurate. And that really places us in a space. Even as we started this feeding and swallowing work, we thought, OK, if there's something going on, this would be the best place to pick it up. So this is what this looks like in humans. The minimal deletion to cause the whole spectrum of phenotypes is 1.5 megabases. You don't need any more. Actually, because of the genomic structure, the chromosomal structure of this region, the more typical deletion is actually broader. It's a 3 megabase deletion. But there's absolutely no difference in the phenotypic spectrum or the phenotypes between the two deletions. So we focus on the genes in the minimal critical region. The mouse model that I will be talking about primarily, and then there are several single gene mutations that we're going to use to take this apart further. We call it the large deletion, or large DEL. Um, it <coughs> deletes all of the 28 orthologs that are orthologous to the genes in the 1.5 megabase deletion, except for the four. And those four are on other chromosomal locations, and they're not expressed in the brain, which means we do not have to worry about them as much. So that's where we're starting. And the other thing is, is that, well, we needed to see, when, you know, is it possible that these mice from birth onward are dysphagic in the way that the kids are? So these are actually growth curves for males and females. Um, of toddlers of the normative 50th percentile and toddlers who have been, from birth onward, infants and toddlers who have been 
diagnosed with 22Q11 deletion syndrome. And as you can see, the boys and the girls do not grow at the same rate as the norm. And we saw the same thing in the mice. So this was a first sort of general hint that something might be up. What happened to the kids that showed failure to thrive? About, it's thought to be about 2 to 3 percent that are picked up total. Uh, this is the most common survivable genomic deletion syndrome other than Down syndrome. It's about one in, it's estimated to be one in 2,000 to one in 3,000 live births. Most of the ascertainment is because of the cardiovascular issues, but now as people have been doing genetic um, analyses of large populations for autism and schizophrenia, it turns out that there are a lot of individuals who are deleted who get those diagnoses who don't have the heart phenotypes that are clinical or they're subclinical. So the new estimate is about 1 in 2,000. And for reference, Down syndrome um, before um, pregnancy planning that, that diminished the population was 1 in 1,000 live births. So we asked, well, are these animals actually actively aspirating? And so the way that this has been looked at in, in 22Q1 kids is by fluorography. But we figured out our own little barium swallow for mice. It's a fluorescent milk assay. We actually get the mice to learn how to nurse on a little nipple. And then we look to see where the fluorescent milk goes. And as you can see, there's the wild type on the left and the large deletion on the right. And these animals aspirate acutely milk into their nasal pharynx. And indeed, milk goes all over the place. Because if we look in the um, nasal cavity, this is actually in the olfactory um, part of the nasal cavity. What we see is we see these large protein inclusions. We actually cleaned up an antibody to mouse milk protein. These are proteinaceous inclusions that are made of milk protein. They're infiltrated by leukocytes. When we look at the lungs, we see frank evidence of lung inflammation that is uh, the pathologic sign of pneumonia. And you can see that here. There are infiltrating macrophages. But when we look at what's in the lungs, it's milk protein. So these animals are actually doing what kids who have perinatal dysphagia do. They are aspirating when they nurse. And so this said, oh, well, OK, they have the behavioral deficit. What's going on biologically? And in order to take that apart, I need to give you a little primer on hindbrain development. So the hindbrain is the region of the brain that the cranial nerves emerge from. It's amongst the earliest region of the brain to develop. Um, it develops and acquires a lot of differentiation, even contemporaneously and even sometimes leading the spinal cord. Um, it develops initially as a series of repeated units called rhombomeres. Um, abbreviated here, R1 to R8 from anterior to posterior. And these repeated units acquire like segments in other developing vertebrates for the body plan, or invertebrates rather, for the body plan. They acquire identity, and that identity actually dictates where each of the cranial nerves emerge from. And you can see the sensory nerves on the left-hand side and the motor nerves on the right-hand side. The details, when you, when you need to know the details, I'll tell you. But just realize that there's a very regular anterior-posterior organization that prefigures this. Now, the other thing that we knew, and this took me back to my roots, is that one of the key signals that establishes this anterior-posterior organization is the signaling molecule retinoic acid, which is distributed in a gradient, um, high posterior and low anterior. And this is a retinoid-sensitive gene that's one of the most responsive, and so we're using this as a sort of an output indicator. There are others. And you can see that it's expressed at high levels in rhombomer 6 and 5, not in 7 and 8. It diminishes in 4 and 3, and by the time it gets 2, it's gone. Now, if we look at a large deletion hindbrain, what we see is that we've undergone a posteriorization. So before any of the other development starts, this is a hindbrain that doesn't know its back and front addresses as well. So basically, the rhombomeres at the anterior regions, particularly R3, which has very little retinoid signaling normally, and R2, which has none, are now 
somewhat posteriorized. And I'm going to use that word colloquially as we go through, but this is what I mean by posteriorized. Their identity based on the expression of this gene and several others that we measured both by quantitative PCR and by in situ or antibody labeling is expanded from where they should be posteriorly into the anterior. And what that does, and I'm showing you this for the first time, but we're going to take a look at the biology of how we get here in some detail, is that it foreshortens the anterior part of the hindbrain, even at slightly later developmental stages. The spacing between the fifth and the seventh ganglia really drops. Um, the ninth and tenth ganglia nerves fuse. And you can even see that there's some change in the way that the motor axons are leaving the hindbrain compared to the wild type, which is on the left for comparison. So something is up. You have first the disruption of the patterning, and next the disruption of the development. And I will tell you now, and then I will show you a little bit of data later, that we can rescue this entire phenotype by simply breeding in one allele of the retinoic acid synthetic enzyme that's responsible for making the active ligand. So normally you breed this in. It's non-phenotypic in a wild-type animal. We breed this into this background, into the large deletion. It restores the patterning deficit, and we have normal cranial nerves. And I'll show you more of that later. So we're going to look first at what is it that happens to the derivatives of our rhombomeres 2 and 3, these anterior spots that become more posterior in their identity? And how is it that the most anterior cranial nerve and ganglion, the trigeminal ganglion and nerve, um, how does it diverge? And does that divergence tell us anything about the sensory um, aspects of initial initiation of the feeding and swallowing um, behavior that needs to happen. Question yeah. It sounded like you just said you can um, obviate, you can stop this by knocking in right. the capacity to produce that relative. To knocking it down. And it's about a 25% reduction. The, but I, I don't understand the relation between that claim and the fact that the pattern is involved. It's not the production. Well, it's, it's, the, it's the ligand that actually leads to the pattern change. And so you reduce the ligand, and the pattern shifts back to the wild type, which is on the left. So, and I will tell you more about that later. All right. So this is what we're looking at. And this is what the trigeminal nerve normally looks like at mid-gestation. You can see very clearly the maxillary, the mandibular, and the ophthalmic branch. All three branches are dysmorphic. And the other thing we see is, and I will tell you much more about this in, in a moment, is that the fasciculation of the growing axons is really disrupted. And there's just a paucity of growth. And so what's going on here? Is there a normal program for cranial nerve 5 development that's been selectively altered by 22Q11 deletion? So where do these guys come from? Well, this is what the whole array of cranial nerve ganglia and their roots look like in a section that's approximately at the angle that the dotted line shows. Now, in order to begin to take apart putting this system together, I have to tell you a little bit more about the embryological origins. The sensory part of the trigeminal nerve comes from two distinct places. Part of it comes from an thickening of the surface of the embryo, the ectoderm, which is also going to make the skin, that retains the capacity to make neurons. It's a very localized area. It's that red spot there. It's one of several cranial placodes. It's called the trigeminal placode because these skin cells actually remain as neural progenitors, and they will delaminate and actually translocate. It's not an active migration, but they'll translocate, and they will make all the mechanosensory neurons of the trigeminal ganglion. So unlike the axial dorsal root ganglia, et cetera, which all come from the neural crest, the mechanosensory cells here are coming from the ectoderm. The nociceptive or pain-sensing cells are generated from the neural crest, and they migrate out. And you can actually see in that box there, they're beginning to accumulate at around E95, which is about a day before the midpoint of gestation at 10.5. 
And so basically the ganglion is a mosaic of two distinct lineages. And you can see that really clearly here because we're using um, a transcription factor 6-1 as a marker of placodal derived cells, which is established. And we're using a WINT1 pre-recombinase driving a reporter in this instance to identify the neural crest. And you can see that uh, the trigeminal ganglion at top is a mosaic of neural crest and um, placodal cells, as is the seventh ganglion. Surprisingly, the otic placode and the eighth ganglion are completely placodally derived. So hair cells, which are going to be mechanoreceptors in a sense, are derived from the placode and not from the neural crest. And the ninth and the tenth ganglia are also mosaics of the two lineages. So what's going on here? Well, it turns out that this lineage distinction is key for generating cellular diversity. Both the placodal and the neural crest derived cells um, make neurons very early. So the neurons that are being that are differentiating even at mid gestation are from both lineage populations. However, when we look at the coincidence of the two lineage populations with markers of early neurogenesis, it turns out that most of the early generated neurons are from the placodal lineage. And that's shown here with BRAIN3A, which is a transcription factor that recognizes really early differentiating neurons, including early differentiating sensory neurons, and also NUN or RBFOX3, which is a general marker for post-mitotic neurons. Now you can see that NUN is in, in all of the, it, it can independently label cells and not just the 6-1 cells, but it is. And when we quantify this, what we see is that indeed most of the cells that are early generated neurons are 6-1 expressing placode derived cells. So to follow up on that diversity, one of the things that we noticed, which was a surprise, is that when we actually looked at the cells that were neural crest derived based on their transcriptional fate mapping with WINT1, Cree, it wasn't all then cells. And there was about half and half, 33% of the, of the whole population, or about 50% of the neural crest population, which we found was neural crest, was not expressing um, the, the, the WINT1 Cree transcriptional lineage marker. So we asked who these cells were, and it actually turns out that there are two different neural crest derived populations of progenitors and differentiating neurons that arrive in the trigeminal ganglion. One is a SOX10. Went one Cree lineage population, and the other is a Went one Cree negative Fox D3 positive. So there are two, there's diversity in the progenitors, even, and I'm telling you this, it's a detail, but I'm telling you this because it turns out that this actually, these are the targets of the early divergence in building the circuit. So, and it also turns out that most of the proliferating cells at this point are both the um, the WINT1 Cree SOX10 and the FOX D3 expressing cells. So we have progenitors that are WINT1 Cree positive, SOX10 positive, incorporate BRDU, indicating that they're actively mitotic. And we have another population that's just as actively mitotic, but they're WINT1 Cree negative and SOX10 negative and express FOX D3. So that's the, the canvas that we're working with. And the question is, is if we're building it this way, does 22Q01 deletion disrupt this particular mechanism of putting the cells that you need to have in place? Now, I will tell you now that everybody knows neural crest migrates from the hindbrain, from rhombomeres 1 and 2, into the trigeminal ganglion. This migration, for every way that we've looked at it so far, is not compromised by this deletion. But what is compromised, and the other question is, is that whether or not anything that changes in these two lineage-derived populations actually influences the capacity of these cells to generate axons that project specifically um, to their targets in the periphery or in the hindbrain. And we'll talk more about that later. So are they, from the outset, are these directed and fasciculated projections that come from these lineage-distinct populations, or are they exuberant and then are sculpted to
form the final pattern um, of connectivity in the circuit. So we're going to take that apart. So this is what these guys look like. And we're first going to ask the question about, well, are the axons fasciculated? Or are they? And what we found, surprisingly, is that these axons know where they're going from the very get-go. This is, we do these injections in live embryos. We then fix them, and we image them whole. So this is actually an, a high-resolution confocal image stack through the entire E11.5 embryo after receiving um, six hours earlier two injections of biocytin in the anterior and posterior aspects of the trigeminal ganglion. We see in the wild type absolutely no mixing of axons. And we also see a really remarkable level of fasciculation from the earliest growing, and they know where they're going. So there is specificity not only in the lineage derivation, but in the ability of these axons. And not only is that specificity seen, but you can see the, both the sensory axons, and those are actually, some of those are motor axons go, that have been in, uh, broken in, and filled from the injection in the ganglion. And you can see, if we look at higher power here, that those axons enter and bifurcate, which is what they're going to do as adult axons as well. So the specificity of this, both centrally and peripherally, is clear. And we really know we can actually isolate these trigeminal sensory neurons in vitro in low-density cultures, and they retain their bipolar identity. So these are really specified bipolar sensory neurons who normally know where they're going and know what they're going to and differentiate accordingly. So is this disrupted by 22Q11 deletion? So this is what we know. They grow to their branchial arch targets in the periphery to the motor nucleus of five and the principal sensory nucleus anteriorly, the spinal nucleus posteriorly. So you have a mechanism that's setting up the circuit very specifically from the very outset. So is it disrupted by 22Q11 deletion? Well, we know that grossly it is. But when we looked at the cellular composition, even at, the early, at this mid-gestation point, we noticed, even visually, that there seemed to be a predomination of the placodal-derived cells at the expense of the neural crest-derived cells. And that actually is, is significant. It's about a 20 to 25 percent change. So proportionately, the 6-1 progenitors, the placode progenitors, go up and the neural crest progenitors go down. So, if this is happening, this is an outset, an early divergence that could actually shift the balance of mechanoreceptive and nociceptive sensory neurons and their innervation in the periphery, and also the connections they're making centrally. So this was suggestive, but we really wanted to know whether or not you're actually changing, based on the genomic lesion, the transcriptional landscape of these cells um, to explain this divergence. And so what we did was we actually microdissected trigeminal ganglia from both um, genotypes. We pooled them to get rid of inner embryo variability. And then we did an RNA-seq experiment with five biological replicates per genotype of pools. And the reason that we did this was we wanted to ask, OK, we have a genomic starting lesion. We have some indication of cellular divergence and differentiation divergence. Is there anything that's identifiable in these cells at this snapshot of time, transcriptionally, that really distinguishes the two populations? So that's what we did. And here are the results. Um, transcriptionally, these two populations are very different. And if you use the cutoff that we chose to use in terms of abundance and um, and Sign false discovery rate significance. There are 134 genes that are differentially expressed in one genotype versus the other. There are nine non-coding transcripts that are found only in wild type and not in large deletion, but they're at very low levels. We report them just to, for completeness. And there are 10 of those guys in the large DEL, but we're not going to follow up on those anymore for this. Now, the other thing is, is that to just tell us we, would, we did the right thing, all of the 22Q11 genes, many of them are expressed in the trigeminal ganglion, which in and of itself is telling us something. But they all are expressed at 
um, a negative one-fold level, which means that, we, that they are indeed heterozygously deleted. Now, just for comparison, we took the whole embryo from the same age, and we said, well, you know, are we really enriching for genes that are um, specific to the trigeminal ganglion? And in the whole embryo, there are 54 genes that meet the same criteria that we used for the differentially expressed genes. Of those, only four overlap with the differentially expressed genes in the trigeminal ganglion, and three of those are, are 22Q1 genes. One is a, um, is a, a, um, a steroid binding protein. We have no idea. It's expressed at you know, relatively low levels, and we have no idea why it goes in two different directions. But that's a piece of information, as these informatics things do. So to further validate this, what we did was we looked at those markers that mark the lineages. And as expected, there is a significant increase in the expression of 6-1. And I will show you also of some of the downstream um, markers that are associated with that population. Um, it's much harder to pick up an, a decrease of the neural crest markers, and we did not. But when we look at the 134 differentially regulated genes that we identified, um, 46 of them are 6-1 regulated based on informatic criteria. 54 are, reg and are regulated by one of the neural crest transcription factors, FOXD3. And 131 out of 134 are potential targets for SOX10 regulation. So this all made sense, but it wasn't really all that satisfying. Um, even so, this confirmed that we could pick up at the message level what we had seen cell biologically, and we thought, well, there might be some information in this. Can, can you yeah? Go back to Yes, and I'll get to that in a minute. That was absolutely the right question. OK, so here we are. And so we actually asked the question a different way, because we had a feeling from other work that we did, we had done, that one of the things that diminished dosage of the 22Q1 genes does, particularly in neuronal populations, is it imparts an enormous amount of stochastic variability. So what we did was we took our each replicate, and we looked across them, and what we noticed, even from the heat maps, was there was a lot more variability in individual genes. And so what we did was we took the entire set of 17,500 non-zero reads from both the wild type and the, and the large deletion, and we just determined the coefficient of variance for each gene in each biological replicate, and then compared that across the population. And what we found was that for approximately 14,500 of the 17,500 non-zero reads, the large deletion genes have significantly greater variation. Whereas, what happened there? Whereas only um, uh, 2,500 or 3,000 of the wild type did, and some, for some reason, it's jumping. Well, it jumped. OK. So we validated some of the candidates. These are all genes that are associated with potential contributions to progenitor identity. I will tell you a little bit about MUN in a moment. Cited 4 is actually interesting because it usually is expressed in posterior rhombomeres, and its expression increases significantly in the trigeminal ganglion, which is derived from anterior rhombomeres. So it's basically in the wrong place based on the AP addresses. These genes, instead, are important for axon growth and guidance. So this kind of these all validated, and it gave us a sense that we, we were in the right domain. So that's what we knew here. And so what we asked, though, was why was this divergence, how was it happening at the outset? Well, to confirm that we were actually getting the ganglion to coalesce, we did the same analysis of the lineages at a slightly earlier age when the ganglion is just coming together. And there's no difference. But within a day, that difference emerges. So what we thought immediately was, oh, there must be some difference in proliferation. So we very carefully quantified the acutely proliferative populations of the placodal and the, and the neural crest cells. And we found absolutely no difference in the overall proportions. And this was perplexing, 
until we remembered that new N, this neuronal marker, goes up. And we asked, well, what cells is it actually increasing in? And it turns out that you're actually getting a larger neurogenic yield from the neural crest population at this early time. So there's anomalous neurogenesis going on from the neural crest progenitors. And this, I will argue, is what's giving you the shifted proportion of placodal versus neural crest-derived cells. And those are the numbers there. And the other thing that we noticed is what Mike commented on, and that was that neighbor relations changed. And as good cell biologists studying tissues that are proliferating, we knew that neighbor relations are actually absolutely determinant in modes of cell division and decisions of whether or not there's going to be self renewal, asymmetric division, or, some, or symmetric terminal division. And when we quantified this, we found that wild type neural crest progenitors are more frequently found adjacent to neural crest progenitors, so like, likes, like, and neural crest, large del neural crest progenitors are more frequently adjacent to placodal. Um, or other progenitors. So there's a shift in the internal organization of the cells, subtle, but nevertheless um, robust statistically. So what we did was we asked, well, does this shift actually include a shift in the mode of cell division? And to do that, we did a pair cell assay. Here we're using SOX2 as a marker for proliferative cells. It turns out that all of the SOX2 cells are also expressed one of the neural crest markers. So we're looking at primarily the neural crest progenitors. And we can pick up the various modes of division because we're looking at only isolated pairs of cells, whether they retain, divide as progenitors, are asymmetric, or give rise to um, terminal symmetric neurogenic offspring. And what we found is that indeed, Oops, there is a significant shift in the number of asymmetric progenitor neuron divisions. So most of the divisions in the wild type are still progenitor progenitors. So you're increasing the progenitor pool that's going to give rise to nociceptive neurons from the neural crest lineage. Whereas in the large deletion, a whole po proportion of that population has shifted. So what does that mean? Well, what it predicts is that if we look at the mature ganglion, or at least postnatal ganglion, that there should be a shift in mechanoreceptors versus nociceptors. And indeed, that's what we see. We're working on quantifying this now. It turns out that stereologically, the mature trigeminal ganglion is a nightmare to count things in. But using track B as a marker for the mechanosensory neurons, you can see that there is an apparent increase. And you can see that there at higher power. And if we do the opposite, we see an apparent decrease of track A, which marks the nociceptive cells. We've now gone through and also done qPCR assessment. And the vanilloid receptor, TRPV1 channel, changes the RET gene, which marks nociceptive gene, CGRP changes, so that there is an indication that we've shifted functionally the population of cells. So, that's where we are, and now we're going to ask about the axon growth. Does this change in apparent identity based on when they're generated and how they're generated change axon growth? So what we're going to do is we're going to actually look at individual axons and their phenotypes. We're going to label these slightly differently in the whole embryo. We can reconstruct in three dimensions. We let a Morris, um, we let an, uh, a software program do this so that it's unbiased. And what we did was we detected a number of quantifiable phenotypes in the large deletion, including there is excessive branching of individual axons, either terminal branching, branching in process, or branching which actually the branches separate, and then they come back together, and they separate, and we call that looping. Um, and we quantified the frequency. And indeed, there are some instances of these phenotypes in the wild type, but there is a really noticeable significant increase in the large deletion. And then we did this rescue, thinking, well, if we're in the right place, we should eliminate these phenotypes. And indeed, by readjusting the anterior posterior patterning that precedes all of this, we return the axon phenotype to normal. And we do that grossly as well. 
So we asked, well, is this specific to the anterior um, cranial nerves, particularly cranial nerve 5? And we knew that one of the genes in the 22Q11 region heterozygously explains another cranial nerve phenotype, and that's the fusion of the 9th and 10th ganglia. And what you see here, this is in, a, in TBX1 heterozygotes. This is the frequency in the large deletion. They're statistically indistinguishable. And the other thing you see is that in the TBX1 mutant, there is not this posteriorization of the anterior rhombomeres. So we asked, well, if we're right, then we shouldn't see these axon phenotypes. So we did the same experiment, and we saw, indeed, that the wild type and the TBX1 cranial nerve 5 are indistinguishable. So when you don't posteriorize the anterior rhombomeres, you don't get the axon phenotypes, and you don't get the gross change. But we identified a gene that actually does, when you knock it out homozygously, um, cause these phenotypes and actually increases them. And this is the RAN BP1 gene, the RAN binding protein. RANs are nuclear import expert co cofactors. And we, they don't have the 910 fusion. And remember this, this posteriorization, because this is what happens to the RAN homozygote, and this predicts that we should get the same axon phenotypes or even enhanced, and that's exactly what we see. So this all is making sense that this small shift in patterning, in part regulated by the RAN gene and whatever effect it has on retinoid signaling, is actually just shifting the circuit development for the sensory neurons in some way that is causing a change in the proportion of mechanoreceptive to nociceptive cells. And so what's going on here? And what we can tell from looking at the developing cells in vitro is that one of the things that's going on is that the axons are actually giving rise to little branches of actin filaments um, all along the shaft, which is really not seen in the wild type. And so we see that, and we're quantifying this now. And the other thing is, is that when we look at the growth cones, we see that the actin cytoskeleton of the growth cones is very different than the wild type counterparts. So what we think that this initial change in the capacity of the cells, of the, the neural crest-derived cells in particular, and I should note that all of these cells, we're actually only looking at Wnt1 Cre um, cells. Um, is, that's why it takes a while, because we have to get the animals, um, that we're looking at a destabilization of the developmental program to actually ident achieve nociceptive identity and specify axon growth. So that's where we're at with this. And then the question is, well, is there any disruption of the motor circuitry that controls feeding and swallowing? And to look at that, yeah? I'll get there. <laughs> it's a good question. So the, but when we look at the motor point, that was, the motor behavior was the first thing. And so the first thing we asked was, well, does the tongue, tongue movement, which actually has to follow the initial ingestion, the sensory um, transduction that allows for suckling to occur and then to begin to move the food bolus back, does tongue movement change? and are the posterior cranial nerves disrupted. So to do that, we actually visualize the motor neurons. This is with a cat a choline acyl transferase reporter. I'm not going to tell you about the morphological changes, but it turns out that the hypoglossal and the dorsal motor nucleus of vagus, the neurons themselves change in their position, their distribution, and their sizes. But what I am going to tell you about is the fact that they're physiologically, they change in really intriguing ways. And this is correlated with a behavioral change that I'll tell you in about a minute. The first thing that changes is the after hyperpolarization. And in, um, if you modify the calcium-regulated potassium channels, the frequency of action potential firing changes in the large deletion, but not in the wild type. So both the ap after hyperpolarization duration and amplitude is altered. And when we look at also at synaptic potentials, we see that spontaneous EPSC 
um, amplitude has changed, not the frequency, but the amplitude. So these are two changes in the output. But then we ask, well, you know, are the neurons different? Well, it turns out that the neurons, their dendrites are dysmorphic, and they have signs of oxidative stress. So this was interesting. We thought, well, you know, are they, they're hyperexcitable in some ways. They are less, there's less glutamate input, but what about the GABAergic input? Well, what we found was that the um, postsynaptic, the iPSCs, are diminished in their frequency. They're also diminished in, um, so, and when we look at mini GAB, uh, the mini iPSCs, they're also diminished in frequency. Um, and so this implied that there was something up with GABA um, synaptic organization and function. So we actually looked at the content of GABA and in GABAergic synapses at the EM level. And you can see the bottom line, the color coding is red is more GABA based on immunogold labeling, and blue is less, and gray is under the threshold of detection. This was all done with automated counting. So this is letting the software do it. And what we see is that the GABA content de declines, the size of the GABAergic terminals declines, and the density of the GABAergic terminals declines. So there's actually a shift in the synaptic organization and the output of the hypoglossal. So finally, is there a change in tongue movement? And what we see doing this by um, videographic fluorography is that the tongue moves much slower. We're actually looking at sensory thresholds in the tongue now. And so the output of this, this is in a slightly older animal, but is that ultimately the circuit to actually command tongue movement is altered. And now we're also looking at, you can also measure in this fluorographic um, approach the actual movement of the, of the liquid bolus through the pharynx into, and into the alimentary tract. And when we look at these animals, these are now older animals, we see the same, in terms of lung inflammation, we see the same indication of aspiration-based um, difficulties. So what I want to end with is that, you know, we've begun to set a baseline for, first of all, determining that there is a very distinct developmental program that reflects the initial patterning of the hindbrain dividing it into these repeated segments, and that that normal program of development puts in place the anterior and the posterior cranial nerves that are necessary to operate this integrated sensory and motor act of recognizing at the, at the oral opening, at the face, at the mouth, at the lips, that there is a food source there, and then beginning the oral motor program it actually allows for the ingestion of food and the movement of the food bolus, the liquid bolus initially, through the mouth into the pharynx, past the larynx, and specifically into the alimentary tract and not into the lungs. This engages primarily what we've looked at so far, at the outset at least, the trigeminal sensory innervation and the um, probably the trigeminal motor and definitely the hypoglossal motor innervation of the tongue. We still have a lot of work to do to look at what happens subsequently on the tra traverse of the food bolus. We do know that the laryngeal motor neurons are altered in their, in their physiological properties and that this seems to be disrupting laryngeal movement, but that data is not as far along, so I won't be talking about it. But what we do know from all of this is that that developmental program that normally puts this hindbrain circuit into place is actually sensitive to this genomic lesion that also can disrupt circuit development in the cortex that mediates complex behaviors. But at a very early stage, that same genetic lesion actually disrupts by disrupting patterning, at the very least, the assembly of this circuit from starting with the identity of the neurons and neural, the neural progenitors and neurons that will give rise to the circuit, how they quantitatively balance, 
and then finally with the actual physiological identity of the output neurons. So we know that dysphagia is preceded by the disruption of this cranial development of this cranial nerve circuit before birth, and the output is seen after. And so we have a good foundation for beginning to understand the details of how normally you make sure that the circuit is in place and in the many ways that it can be broken. And, you know, this is actually, surprisingly, no one has ever really worked on this before. So we were actually putting this together from the, from the ground up. And so we think we have a really good foundation for continuing to work on this essential innate behavior. And the other thing is, is that this may actually allow us to begin to think in more detail about clinical correlations, at the very least, of how we can apply what we know biologically to some of the phenomenology that's seen in perinatal dysphagia. These are the people who did the work. These are the people who paid for it. And this is where it was done. Thank you. Right. How does that get so, you know, I mean, the real answer is we're not sure. And one of the things we have to do is we have to look both physiologically and also just structurally at the peripheral innervation, both the motor and the sensory innervation, and ask about integration. And one thing that's not known, unlike, you know, the only real precedent for this work is um, Liz Engel and others, first working in human mutations and then working in animal models, have made the same argument for the development of the oculomotor circuitry, that it basically develops based on hindbrain AP patterning, and that in extreme genetic syndromes where it's disrupted, there is epilepsy later in life. First thing you pick up is eye movement issues from birth onward, and the reason is, is that you've disrupted the AP patterning of the hindbrain, and you've disrupted not only the in development of the individual nerves that innervate the eye muscles, but also the integration through the medial longitudinal fasciculus and others. Um, we don't know that much about the internucle in the hindbrain, the internuclear integration between the posterior motor nerves that have to really initiate the tongue movement, and then the anterior sensory nerves that are actually doing the, at least the initial sensation on the lips and the tongue. Um, one thing that's possible is, is that you have a mismatch of, you know, imagine that nociception is going to tell you, is the food bowl is too big if I expanded the oral cavity too much? It's also going to tell you something about the overall temperature and, you know, quality of the, the mechanoreception is actually going to set up the reflex. And if those, thing, those two things don't match, and if you have basically a hyper-excitable output to the tongue, how you get those two things to integrate has to be through the integration in the hindbrain. And we think that that's actually one of the next things that we're going to need to look at is, is there, are there specific pathways like for the oculomotor complex that is distributed in the AP axis that puts this together? Um, are those controlled by the AP patterning? And is that dysregulated so that basically that mismatch leads to eventually changing the, the, how the tongue is, is able to move? But it's a great question. What happens to the kids that survive this? One of the things that happens is that throughout life they have difficulty eating. So one of the constant problems with this whole population is that they have a lot of nutrition issues. They have not frank eating disorders that have been reported, but what does happen is, is you know, they have often have multiple psychiatric diagnoses later in life. Early in life they have developmental diagnoses in about 
well, up to 60% of them. Yes. So they have a hypernasal speech, and one of the things that doesn't work properly is paddle elevation. And there's another part of this whole work that's actually looked at the development of the, of the palatal muscles and the palatal bones in this and how they get innervated. And that actually is also disrupted. So it seems like the other part of this is the actual control of palatal innervation. And that also results in this hypernasal speech that most of these kids have, and then that is retained to, um, into adulthood. So right at this point, what we know is that throughout life, the 22Q11 individuals that come to clinic, either because they had cardiovascular surgery and they're followed, as a comorbidity, they have feeding, swallowing, and orosensory motor issues. Um, they also have a lot of dysarthria and disarticulation you know, when, they, when they speak, so they're not only hypernasal, but their speech is not distinct. Yeah, they are, they are hypercalcemic and they are immune compromised. So, you know, and that's another, you know, and you can see again, this is the, you know, you can't disembody any of this because what's going on in the brain is actually, ref also there are biomechanical issues with the oris pharyngeal periphery, but also the inflammation that results from the aspiration may actually be enhanced by the immune compromise status. So there's an interlocking. And it turns out, I mean, one of the things that I didn't say, but I really want to reinforce, and one of the reasons why we realized this was important to look at, was this is one of the most serious clinical complications for these kids. This lands them in the emergency room because they're constantly getting pneumonia, they're constantly getting sinus infections, they won't eat, they start losing weight. And the parents, if you talk to parents of these kids, it's the thing that really, really frustrates them because they're constantly worried that either the infant is going to choke, which they do do, or that they're going to get these horrible infections, and you know, particularly if they're post-surgical. Um, and so one of the things that we've been talking with cardiovascular, uh, neonatal cardiovascular surgeons about is that this is a, this is a problem in general for kids with CHD peri, you know, around the point of surgery post-surgically. Um, and so we're wondering whether or not in some instances that's because whatever genetically has happened has not only disrupted aortic arch development, but it's also disrupted hindbrain development in innervation. Mm -hmm. um, contributes to the aortic arches. Right. So most of them do not have, you know, clinically diagnosable cleft palate. They have this velopharyngeal insufficiency, and indeed, before the genomic association was made with these patients, it was either referred to as DeGeorge syndrome or velocardiofacial syndrome because of the velo, the in, the disruption of the elevation of the velum, the the soft part of the posterior palate and the hypernasal speech, and the aspiration. And in fact, one of the signs of these kids that used to be clinically used, according to the lore that I've heard, is that they bubble milk through their nose. And so, you know, but the oropharyngeal periphery, it turns out that the gene that I referred to, RANBP1, um, part of this program, Tom Maynard, who is a colleague of mine at GW, have been really focusing on exactly these questions of, and 
the neural crest, not because of migration, but because of proliferation and differentiation issues that gives rise to the dorsal bones that anchor the paddle muscles. That neural crest is selectively disrupted by RAN BP1. He's actually done the experiments where he takes it out of the placodal and the crest, and you, you get, you phenocopy it. The full, the full null, because this is in the homozygous null, so this is a contributory gene. And so what that tells us, and it's not a migration problem, there, we have not been able to pick up neural crest migration issues. It seems that for some reason, some of it is patterning clearly in the hindbrain because the RAN mutation enhances the posteriorization defect um, if you do it homozygously, um, is that the capacity of neural crest cells, once they migrate properly to differentiate, to go through their morphogenetic program and give rise to the, the oropharyngeal structures that they have to give rise to, is compromised. And so what we don't know is, of course, the muscles come from the mesoderm. The smooth muscles don't. But the bone and the cartilage are definitely compromised, and now what we're interested in is whether or not secondarily there's a change in the musculature that enhances these circuit changes in terms of innervation. And this is important not only for the palatal soft tissue, the, the muscles in the palate, but also for the tongue musculature, and this is something that we're, you know, as a next step following up. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, motor right. And, and it made me think, you know, I think one thing we learned from first studies and all of the cranial disinnervation disorders is right. how precise that system is. Right. The patient is with the three motor neurons that right. this one phenotype. Do you think the same thing's going to happen in this person? Yeah. And maybe it won't apply to the 22 deletion um, right. patients, but to other uh, phenotypes that, that could arise. Yeah, you know, right now, this is the only genetic model for this. Um, there are no other m mouse. It hasn't been looked at, but, you know, so we don't know in terms of the precision, you know, whether or not, as Liz and all of the other people who are now working on this have shown that, you know, you can disrupt a very small number of motor neurons. They haven't really looked as much at the sensory innervation of the, which is an interesting issue in and of itself. But um, for the motor neurons, you can disrupt a very small number of the overall circuit, and you can get really noticeable phenoty phenotypes. Um, and those genes, some of those are, some of the rare mutations are Hox genes. Some of them are kinesins. You know, they're things that either are involved in patterning or in process growth and movement. Um, so one of the reasons why we did the, and we also have done a, a similar transcriptome study of the earlier hindbrain to see what, is to pick up some, even some shared overlap of genes that are associated with those sorts of hindbrain issues. Um, unfortunately, the nature of the genomic starting point here is not a complete loss of function. And so what we're seeing is this other phenomenon, which is the way that this works mechanistically at the transcriptional level, we would hypothesize, is that you're basically randomizing a lot of the transcriptional programs and that it biases toward one outcome or another. There's a lot of variability in this, and you know, to get the signal, it's, uh, we have to look at. And interestingly, it's more robust in the embryos, and there's dropout all along the way. So by the time we get to the living animals at P8, those are the ones who have gotten through the bottleneck of the cardiovascular issues. And there, we're wondering whether or not respiratory control is also disrupted by this. And so, and those animals would drop out. And we actually, we keep track of the Mendelian ratios prenatally and postnatally because we're, and we see a decline from, you pick up 50% of the mid-gestation embryos. So at that point, it's not embryonic lethal. Postnatally, we go down to about 30% of survival um, and even lower. And so.
you know, this all figures into answering the question of, well, you know, can you target just a really isolated population of neurons who have been misspecified and attribute some of the behavioral change to them? And I don't know that that's going to be possible.